Hello. This is a transmission of the uh, Jewish Socialist Bund, which is found at that website, Jewish Socialist Bund with hyphens.net. And we are making a transmission today to commemorate the passing, the loss of five uh, Bundes comrades in Phoenix, Arizona, May 27th, 2019. And on this occasion, uh, we can announce the uh, publishing of their writings in the first book of the uh, publication, which is called The Manual, or The Manual of Revolution. And I will be going through this in order to provide uh, the, uh, the uh, work thinking of the comrades um, who were killed by the um, Nazi, uh, goes by the name of Jared 88, who um, perhaps uh, is not uh, no longer around. So we will go through the uh, book itself. And uh, the purpose of the book, first of all, is to transmit uh, their knowledge and their writings and their innovations uh, along uh, Bundes lines, which are applicable to any other social formation as well. Because the Jewish Bund, uh, which sought to develop a program of national cultural autonomy for the Jewish nation in Europe, that is the Ashkenazi nation of the Jewish people. And uh, the concept of autonomy, of course, is applicable to uh, any other national minority in a uh, given country, any given country, and uh, also is applicable to any other social, social formation which requires its own autonomy to become independent, independent thought, security, and uh, history. So, you know, we're talking about social formations such as the women gender, the uh, queer community, um, and uh, basically, you know, the, the working class itself in each of the social formations which uh, requires its own uh, autonomy as well to become independent of the bourgeoisie in the class struggle. So the concept of autonomy, which uh, the Bund has elaborated to um, social formations uh, in general is uh, very necessary in terms of revolutionary socialist theory, which has not been the case previously because uh, previously the uh, Emancipation of uh, the working class was defined as individual workers uh, seeking to achieve their autonomy as workers, uh, as part of the working class, but not uh, in terms of uh, a collective. That means that the working class as a collective, the Jewish people as a collective, women as a collective, queers as a collective, must have their own autonomy, their own decision-making process, their own uh, security, um, their own self-sustenance, their own theory, their own history, their own archives, their own schools, their own language, even if necessary, like Yiddish. This is, you know, Yiddish speaking, which uh, needs to be preserved and protected even in spite of the Zionists who are seeking to destroy it as well. So... Uh, you know, the concept of autonomy that we're developing here has a general applicability, you know, in, in political theory. So we're going to go through this uh, in order to commemorate their memory and may their memory live forever. Here we go. Now, here's the front cover. And this is a, a photo that I took in France during the uh, confinement uh, when I was caught in uh, in uh, southern France for three months and uh, went to the demonstration in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement on the occasion of uh, George Floyd's uh, assassination, basically. Together with the others, you know, have been uh, murdered and killed um, extra juridical massacre of uh, a number of uh, black individuals in the United States of America, which uh, specializes in serial, serial killers, 
who are either in police uniform or uh, are uh, white supremacists, you know, who go around uh, trying to ignite a civil war by uh, using their uh, AK-47s, you know, to uh, kill, uh, uh, you know, some dozens of people at a time. So, you know, we're talking about a general phenomenon which has to be opposed, and we are. And we developed, you know, the largest movement in American history to do so. So this is Nice, France in 2020. And uh, this is the uh, uh, the second book of uh, writings from the uh, Bundes comrades. And uh, it contains the table of contents from the first book, which is being published at this time. And I'll go through that with you. The five comrades there were part of the Jewish Bundes diaspora movement, which was uh, developing a, a unit of the uh, Jewish Socialist Bund on an international scale, even not just American, uh, were uh, aware of this movement. The uh, dedication of the book is to the five comrades, Uri Adeya, Hannah Toff, Isaac P. Kamenstein, Marvin Eliyahu, and Miriam Emmesberg, all in Phoenix, Arizona. And it also happens to be uh, on the commemoration of the 125th anniversary of the founding of the Jewish Bund in 1897. The Jewish Bund, which was a Jewish liberation movement at the time and developed uh, the program of national cultural autonomy, later picked up by some social Democrats to try to sort of incorporate Hungary into the Austro-Hungarian empire, which didn't work. So uh, we are working together in the uh, United International Intercommunalist Convergence. And here are some of the principal um, uh, active organizations uh, who helped to uh, put together this, uh, these publications, these two books, Jewish Socialist Bund, that's ourselves. Myself as editor, Dr. Ibrahim Weisfeld. I am a political science uh, doctor from the University de Quebec at Montreal. And uh, Comrade Ned in Phoenix, Arizona, also a member of the Jewish Bundes Diaspora movement at the time. And uh, we're working together with Panther Code, and uh, we have founded a, uh, a joint chapter of uh, Panther Code uh, members, Black Jewish Bundists, who now have their own chapter as well. The Anglist in England, um, also an Irish militant, Jason Unruh in Ontario, Maoist Rebel News, and uh, the original Jewish Bund um, group uh, on Facebook. And the uh, Lump of Third Oldest, uh, who is also in England. And uh, we're, in addition, working with the People's Social Freedom Movement in the United States. And uh, the original uh, channel of the Bundes movement is also available, still available as an archive. Now, Let's go first through the uh, first book. There was an introduction by Black Minister 13 of the Panther Code, marvelous introduction, and a marvelous history of work since the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party. And uh, this is an introduction to, um, which solidifies the the convergence between the uh, concept of national cultural autonomy for both the uh, Jewish nationality and for the Black nation. National cultural autonomy for the Black nation would be self-defense, uh, its own uh, political administration, its own police force, of, and its own educational system, its own um, uh, religious institutions as well. Etc. All of the uh, cultural facets of a nation are guaranteed by cultural uh, cultural autonomy in this manner, and this is elaborated by Black Minister Thirteen of Panther Code. A very uh, great breakthrough that was accomplished. So, in the first chapter, uh, we have uh, my uh, old uh, article on the new Bund and the old anti-Semitism. 
pointing out the need for the bun to be regenerated. And this is what I've been working on uh, all my life, actually, because my mother, you know, raised me as a Jewish Bundes, you know, because she was from Warsaw and she escaped from the Warsaw ghetto by means of the uh, Jewish Bund and her brother who formed a partisan uh, unit in the forest in Russia. And uh, the uh, partisans, you know, were uh, never defeated by the Nazis and they could never uh, uh, occupy the territories that they held in the, uh, uh, in the, in opposition to the uh, Nazi occupation of Russia uh, during those years, uh, 41, 42, 43, 44, and 45. And uh, the partisans, the Jewish partisans in particular, were the first to oppose the Nazi invasion. And, and then the Red Army came online, you know, after it was rebuilt, despite the uh, dismissal of the uh, Red Army generals by Stalin just before the invasion by the Nazis, because he didn't think Hitler would break his word. Uh, and uh, agreement, you know, with Stalin. Okay. Donna Newman is a, a founding member of the Jewish Bundes diaspora movement under the inspiration of her aunt, who uh, was a Bundist uh, and also a, um, a Holocaust survivor as well. Now, the third worldism of the Jewish Bund is the convergence of the Jewish Bund um, political philosophy with the Maoist third worldism uh, theory that has been developed, which refers to the um, the uh, international revolution that is taking place in a vanguard manner by the third world, not the first world, which is you know the. Uh, the uh, assumption made by, you know, Marxist theory that, you know, the working class as being the most advanced, the most developed, the strongest, you know, in Europe, you know, would, you know, be leading the, the world socialist uh, revolution. However, that didn't turn out to be the case because the working class was co-opted to a great extent, you know, using imperialist super profits. So the third worldism uh, the Jewish Bund, you know, recognizes, you know, the vanguard role of the third world. And this is elaborated by Donna Newman and uh, is uh, further elaborated by Jason Unruh of um, Maoist Rebel News, uh, who has elaborated the theory of third worldism. Now, the third worldism theory lends itself to conceiving of the national minorities in the first world, like the Jewish nationality, as being what's called a fourth world, or, you know, we can give it a subtitle of a fourth worldism. So the Jewish Bund is a fourth worldism expression of what third worldism is, because the fourth world is like the third world inside the first world. So, you know, the black nation in the United States of America is a, a fourth world within the first world because it is a segregated society practicing apartheid in which uh, the black nation workers are treated as uh, cheap labor uh, while being offered you know, supposed integration into the northern uh, municipalities. Uh, nonetheless, uh, they're uh, relegated to a caste or a social order of the lower working class. And even though some uh, uh, black Amer uh, black uh, <laughs> Afro-Americans, the, as they used to be called, um, have made it into the middle class. This middle class was initially um, massacred in Tulsa. And now, you know, the entire world, you know, middle class is being decimated, you know, by the economic crisis that is taking place as well. So that is not an avenue for the liberation of the Black nation in the United States, obviously. And the Black nation, in particular, its working class, must be organizing itself on autonomous basis in order to form the vanguard uh, uh, formation of the American working class together with the uh, uh, Mexica uh, uh, Spanish speaking uh, working class and, uh, migrants and, uh, and citizens of the United States, you know, to form necessary um, uh, critical mass in order to initiate and ignite the socialist revolution in the United States. 
which will eventually, you know, be followed by the white working class as well, because they will realize, you know, the benefits, you know, uh, of being autonomous and uh, and uh, the uh, solidarity, you know, that is being expressed, you know, by the uh, fourth world, you know, for the uh, working class in the first world, in spite of the national bourgeoisie. Then we go into uh, solidarity for the oppressed and the exploited of the world, okay, with Donna Newman again. Uh, now, uh, Comrade Net, Nathaniel Ben Yahshua, is uh, doing some precise work here defining Jewishness. Now, Jewishness is something that uh, exists apart or beyond uh, Jewish identity. Jewish identity is something that is rather, you know, well-defined in terms of those uh, children who are uh, born of Jewish mothers and uh, come from a Jewish family, even if the father is not Jewish. And uh, uh, otherwise, uh, Jewish uh, the children of uh, a Jewish parent uh, uh, can uh, learn what it is to be Jewish if they so wish and become Jewish by going through an orthodox uh, educational process. And uh, Jewishness is those uh, people who have been exposed to a Jewish environment, you know, with a Jewish parent perhaps, but are not necessarily Jewish themselves. So it gets very intricate, you know, and um, is important to define because... Um, what we are defining in, in those terms is uh, the Jewish nation itself. Now, Comrade Net uh, also proceeds to uh, deal with the Bundes movement uh, message to the Marxist Leninists, Marxist Leninists, Maoists, and Maoist third worldists. And uh, Comrade Net is very much in contact with all the various currents of thought along those lines. And People's Social Freedom Movement, for example, and all of which come together with many different sort of tendencies in the uh, United International Intercommunalist Convergence. So, intercommunalism, of course, was a theory developed by uh, Dr. Uh, Huey P. Newton. Not many people know that uh, that uh, Huey Newton, you know, was a, uh, a PhD in uh, political theory. And he wrote a, a thesis, you know, elaborating to some extent, you know, what intercommunalism is. Uh, as uh, you may know, uh, communalism is, you know, the the, um, the consciousness of belonging to a particular um, um, culture, and uh, without, you know, an internationalist perspective, such a culture may easily fall into a chauvinistic, you know, mentality, as the Zionists, you know, have manipulated the Jewish people into doing. So, communalism, in itself, is a very limited, you know, uh, and can become a very reactionary phenomenon. But intercommunalism, in which each you know, uh, communal formation recognizes uh, the other in a reciprocal manner for mutual recognition, you know, that becomes something entirely different. That's called intercommunalism. The problem you know, can best be expressed in terms of you know, what we have seen in Palestine. There, in the Oslo Interim Agreement, um, you know, fabricated you know, with uh, Yasser Arafat, Abu Amar, uh, the uh, Palestine Liberation Organization uh, ended up, you know, recognizing the state of Israel. But the state of Israel did not recognize, you know, the, the state of Palestine, which was is theoretically, you know, supposed to have come into existence, you know, five years after the signing of the agreement, which, of course, did not happen. So it was just a way to uh, uh, defeat the uh, revolutionary upsurge called the Intifada, uh, that began in 1987 on the 20th anniversary of the occupation of the West Bank by the uh, uh, Israel's war that uh, basically it provoked itself. It itself provoked. So um, this is, you know, an expression of the uh, mutual recognition between the Bundes movement and the uh, uh, other movements of liberation, in particular the Black Liberation Movement as expressed by various um, components uh, as uh, as listed there. Then, yes, we get back into, you know, uh, first worldism and, and uh, the critique of first worldism, which essentially is a critique of the classical Marxism, which uh, assumed, you know, that the first world, you know, would be leading, you know, the world into socialism as a, as a vanguard. However, this was uh, based upon a formal logic, you know, 
uh, methodology, which is uh, called a linear periodization, in which Europe, you know, developed, you know, from feudalism to capitalism, and therefore, since it was the first to develop, you know, capitalism, it would be the first to develop into socialism as well, as if capitalism, you know, leads directly into socialism. However, that's not been the case. So this is a critique of uh, what is called first worldism. Donna again comes by to uh, make the anti-Zionist critique uh, on the basis that Zionism is not Jewish. In fact, it's anti-Jewish. This is uh, can be easily seen as uh, as being demonstrated, you know, by the by the fact that the Zionist movement has suppressed uh, Yiddish as a Jewish national language, and uh, and. Uh, uh, elaborated uh, a version of Hebrew that wasn't, that isn't, you know, ancient Hebrew, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, modernist uh, Hebrew, which uh, takes American words, you know, and spells them with Hebrew letters <laughs> and calls that Hebrew. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, that's Zionism for you. Now in the uh, second volume, uh, we have the writings of the five martyrs. And there's a joint open declaration of the Bundes movement, which was formulated by Uri Hidea, Hannah Toff, Isaac M. P. Uh, Kammerstein, Marvin Eliyahu, and Miriam Emmensberg. Uh, so they were very uh, prolific writers, all brilliant people who are lost now. And they were all gunned down and their bodies taken away even by the police and thrown into vans together with, you know, uh, Torah. Yes. From the synagogue, the Jew, you know, Jewish reconstructionist synagogue, at which uh, uh, Isaac Kamenstein, who was the uh, uh, Rebbe, you know, he was the you know um, theocratic leader. Uh, he was uh, um, you know killed on the occasion of his uh, marriage with his partner, and, uh, and the others came to celebrate that. And then all in all, you know, 27 people were killed, including uh, about six children. So what these writings demonstrate is their existence, their thought, their thinking, their ideas, and uh, their um, offerings to us to assimilate in terms of thought, to develop a revolutionary theory, which is not fully developed, not sufficiently developed in order to actually carry out, you know, the socialist revolution. The socialist revolution can only happen on the basis uh, of ideas, concepts. And uh, these concepts are elaborated, you know, in part towards uh, the whole, which is uh, part of, uh, of, of what we are calling the convergence. Miriam Emmonsberg talked about autodetermination instead of self-determination. This is an elaboration of a concept that I put forward in uh, my doctoral thesis, which is called Nation, Society, and the State, in which I uh, do a very precise uh, delimitation of what each of those concepts represents. Nation, society, and the state. Okay, nation is a nation. It's a people, you know, in a sociological sense. Uh, society is civil society in which everyone is concluded is living in the same country. And the state is what administers, you know, and it, and is this superstructure that imposes itself on top of uh, the base. And the base is the nation with its um, civil society. But it's not the same as a nation. The state is only an artificial creation, which uh, cannot endure and usually breaks down after a certain period of time and exists only to wage war, basically. You know, like uh, that's what the state is for. And, you know, to protect the, um, the security of the national bourgeoisie so they don't get ripped off or invaded. You know, that's basically what the state is. So autodetermination instead of self-determination. Self-determination is associated, you know, with the concept of sovereignty. And sovereignty is associated with the state, whereas autodetermination is associated with the nation, with the people, with civil society. So they, in effect, you know, contradictory, even though, you know, people sort of tend to think that they're same or, uh, you know, are just, you know, uh, uh, one is, you know, expressed in English and the other is ex expressed in French. But the French term, autodetermination, is a much more elaborate concept and, con 
uh, and uh, it works much better to describe, you know, what the Jewish Bund is talking about. Whereas self-determination is the state on its own behalf determines what it is going to do all, all by itself, independently, you know, as an expression of its own sovereignty. You know, so this is what, you know, for example, you know, the Ukraine is doing, you know, in the Donbass, you know, it decides, you know, that its borders are, you know, just to the, uh, you know, the outer limits uh, of um, of the, the Donbass region, even though the people, you know, living there uh, are Russian speaking Ukrainians. And they're, you know, not allowed to be Russian speaking Ukrainians because, you know, the state of Ukraine has defined itself as being Ukrainian and only Ukrainian even though that's practically the same as Russian. So, you know, they even split, you know, the uh, Orthodox church there, you know, so they have their own church, you know, this is like, you know, uh, a, replic uh, a, a replication of the um, Reformation when, you know, in national sort of, you know, uh, uh, cultures seeking their independence and their own democratic rule, uh, you know, to govern themselves as an independent nation, you know, set up their own religion as well, you know, to say that this was justified, you know, and justify, you know, what what their self-determination was going to be all about. So in Germany, you had uh, Lutheranism. In uh, Holland, in Netherlands, you had Calvinism. In England, you had Anglicanism. In fact, you know, the King Charles was anointed, you know, with a holy oil recently, you know, uh, and, you know, as uh, practiced by the Anglican Church. So he was made the king of uh, the Great Britain or the United Kingdom, uh, declared to be such, you know, by the Ang Anglican Church. So it's, you know, a the theocratic, you know, nation state, you know, it's, uh, it's an abomination, <laughs> as the religious terms, you know, go. But autodetermination is a people who have, you know, developed, you know, the means, you know, to ensure their own security, their own independence, their own culture, uh, not in opposition to any other culture, you know, with whom they are living, but as an expression of its own autodetermination, which respects, respects the autodetermination uh, of uh, any other social formation with whom it is living, you know, in particular other nationalities. This is the opposite of self-determination. I'll give you another example of why it's the opposite of self-determination. In uh, Burundi and Rwanda, there were two genocides. People usually only know about the second, in which the Tutsis were massacred uh, by the Hutus. Okay. But prior to that, and why did they do that? You know, because you know, the, the, the proportion of Tutsis in the population who are a minority was, you know, getting stronger, you know, and uh, you know, threatened to undermine the majority of the population who were Hutus. So the Hutus, you know, in a chauvinistic way, you know, with uh, the state, you know, that they established in its expression of self-determination, tried to wipe out as many Tutsis as possible in order to guarantee their majority in that nation state. Well, the same thing happened, you know, in Burundi, where the Tutsis were, you know, a slum majority and they didn't want the Hutus, you know, to become uh, a majority. And so then, in order to protect their self-determination, they carried out, you know, a genocidal massacre of the Hutus, which later, you know, did the same thing and carried out a massacre of the Tutsis. So the problem there is not one or the other, you know, uh, being, you know, superior and not one or the other having, you know, one religion that, you know, that they wanted to dominate the other religion with, you know, because they're both Christian. So what was it? You know, they're trying to guard uh, the um, absolute control of their majority over the nation state with when, within which they were living. So, you know, for their self-definition, their self-determination, that state, you know, tried to wipe out the national minority involved. Hmm. And they did it to each other, you know. So, you know, that demonstrates, you know, the insanity of the concept of self-determination and consequently the insanity, the rationality of sovereignty as well. Autodetermination is the opposite, you know, as expressed by the uh, Lugansk and uh, and uh, Donetsk uh, People's uh, Autonomous Republics, which had previously been, you know, in a federation, you know, with the Ukraine's uh, country, and they had a federation in which they had their own autonomy, and they were Russian speaking, they had their own schools, their uh, 
you know, uh, everything. But the uh, central administration of Kaif, after the Mendean uh, coup d'etat, so-called revolution, in, in, in manipulated by the United States and NATO, determined that uh, these Russian-speaking people, you know, were not um, Ukrainians, and that uh, the, only the territory, you know, was Ukrainian. So the idea was, you know, as expressed by some of the Nazis, you know, who were in the military uh, leadership of the Ukrainian forces that attacked the Donbass, you know, since 2014, that they were going to wipe out, you know, 80% of the Russian speaking population of the Donbass and keep all the resources and, you know, the uh, industrial infrastructure there for the Ukraine itself, you know, the centralized government. So the, uh, you know, Donetsk and Lugansk, you know, uh, nationalities, in their what was you know previously provinces that had become autonomous, you know, formed their own militias in order to defend themselves, you know, against the invading you know military force sent by Kiev, you know, with the intention of you know wiping them out. So uh, this mil militia, uh, uh, you know, uh, maintained uh, control over about a third of the Donbass. Uh, in spite of the you know superior uh, central military forces sent by the Ukraine, so uh, finally, in uh, uh, two years ago, uh, Russia came in to uh, help of uh, the uh, uh, auto determination of the Donbass and Lugansk uh, uh, nationalities, and they've been doing so successfully. So uh, this is against uh, the self determination of the sovereign nation state of the Ukraine with justice because uh, a nationality, a minority nationality has to assume its own self-defense self and, and self-determination uh, as an auto-determination in which they uh, choose to exist in federation either within Ukraine and now they've chosen to live in a federated, you know, Russian federation. There you have it. That's a, you know, an elaboration, a very important elaboration of that uh, article, which is uh, presented to you by Miriam Emmensberg, who was quite a theorist. Uh, Isaiah Kamenstein writes on uh, the committees and the Black Jewish connection. So uh, the Jewish identity accommodates uh, the Black identity because within the Jewish people, you have uh, more than one nation. Jewish people is like a conglomeration of various, you know, like cultural, national sort of expressions of what it is to be Jewish. So in Europe, you had the Ashkenazi Jewish nation, you know, in particular, for example, I am an Ashkenazi. Uh, Ashkenazi means, you know, like German in Hebrew. So that is where, you know, the uh, Ashkenazi Jewish people comes from. Uh, basically, you know, in the Ruhr Valley around... Uh, the uh, city of worms, it's called <laughs> for some reason. And there, you know, Mitteleuchdeutsch, you know, became the uh, 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 basic, you know, like uh, infrastructure upon which, you know, Yiddish was built to include, you know, Hebrew and Polish, you know, uh, concepts and words. So, um, you know, uh, the uh, Jewish people then comprised... Um, uh, you know, uh, in Europe of the Ashkenazi nation. The Ashkenazi nation itself <clears throat> had various components, you know, social formations within, you know, that were influenced by the various countries within which they lived. So there were uh, in, in Polish Jewish people, uh, Polish Jewish nationality, fourth world within the first world of Poland, even after it became independent. Then you have you know, the other Eastern uh, European uh, Jewish uh, communities, you know, the Glaziana, you know, and then the Hungarian Jewish community, which didn't speak Yiddish, you know, so it gets, you know, very complicated. Okay. Now, that is to be differentiated, you know, from the Central European Ashkenazi Jewish nation. You know, the German Jewish people, you know, were, you know, more so, you know, assimilationist. They didn't speak Yiddish. They looked down upon the Yiddish speaking poor Jewish, you know, uh, community of Eastern Europe. And uh, they found that uh, being assimilationist, you know, was no defense against the Nazis. And they had to escape 
uh, or uh, um, be um, uh, assassinated and burned. So the German Jewish population is another, you know, sort of national formations within the Ashkenazi Jewish formation. Then there's the French Jewish population, which is also assimilationist. You know, there they're usually sort of obliged to change their first name into some sort of French name, even though they can keep their Jewish family name. You know, uh, France is very assimilationist and very conservative, reactionary uh, in that respect. And uh, nonetheless, there was a strong Jewish, you know, um, uh, resistance movement during the occupation by the Nazis, uh, which inspired uh, the uh, the general sort of resistance, uh, together with uh, de Gaulle and his uh, uh, tendencies. So uh, that's how that works. Then Isaiah Kamenstein writes about the free, the diaspora, it means the international Jewish communities, uh, with the Voltarian Deukait. Okay. So what does it mean to be Jewish living in the international sort of arena? It means that Deukait or Dochkait in real Yiddish uh, means that, you know, like we are living here, we are uh, uh, what we are, you know, like if we're living in Poland, we're Polish. If we're living in the United States of America, we're Americans, supposedly. And, uh, you know, it goes for any other country that Jewish people are living in, you know, because they have a dual identity, a dual identity, you know, like means, you know, that you don't have to be just one thing, you know, <laughs> like in terms of language, you know, like my parents, for instance, you know, spoke five languages because they lived, lived in, in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, you know, which is the size, you know, like a, of a country like Canada or the United States, uh, you know, like had various, uh, you know, national cultures and various languages. So what did the people do? They spoke, you know, all the various languages, you know, so my parents spoke Polish. They spoke Romanian. They spoke Russian. They spoke German and Yiddish, you know, five languages. And they had no formal education. <laughs> you know, it just, you know, it's part of life, you know, it's natural. And yet here, you know, for example, in the first world you know, of Canada and here in Quebec in particular, which is a national minority within Canada, you know, the Quebec nation exists and it's been recognized as such, but, you know, it has a national uh, minority of English speaking people who used to, uh, used to dominate, you know, the this province and no longer do uh, because Quebec has been winning its autonomy, you know, bit by bit. So French is the first language here now. And the English uh, community, which lives in Western Montreal, as they call it, you know, has the greatest difficulty to learn French. <laughs> as if, you know, you should only be living with one language, you know, and everybody has to learn English so that they can speak with you, but you don't have to learn any other language to speak with, you know, other people. Which is, you know, part of the, you know, U.S. hegemony over the world, you know, so English is becoming like an international language for that reason. But, you know, people are going to uh, become uh, multicultural and learn more than one language for sure. This is already, you know, like uh, becoming an imperative in the United States, you know, where Spanish as a second language is becoming sort of very necessary. And even the, uh, you know, the black dialect of English, you know, has become its own sort of, you know, version of Yiddish. And deserves to be so, and has its own culture and its own music and its own literature, and that's going to continue and become more elaborate. Then Marvin Eliyahu, the United Multinational Federation of Palestine. Ah, this is an elaboration of uh, some of the concepts that I uh, brought out in in the in the doctoral thesis that I did at the University of Quebec Montreal, in which you cannot have a solution. Uh, which separates, uh, you know, the, the peoples, you know, into different uh, nation states, you know, because one, they're living together anyway, you know, you can't separate them. And you can't have a liberal, sort of, you know, uh, singular, you know, nation state either, you know, because who's going to be the majority? <laughs> you know, so you're going to have, you know, the same sort of problem as in Rwanda, Burundi. You know, that doesn't work either, you know, which just leads to civil war. So what does work is the Bund's concept of a multinational society, which uh, organizes itself on the basis of autonomy. So each nation has its own autonomy, as we've talked about, you know, autodetermination, 
And this forms a, a federation. This is a constitutional concept, you know, which is elaborated by Marvin Eliyahu here. Next, we have the Bundes movement is the vanguard of the Jewish proletariat. Yes. So, you know, the, the uh, we do not recognize the Zionist parties as being representative of the Jewish people. We consider the Jewish uh, Bundes movement to be the uh, representative of the Jewish people, and particularly the Jewish proletariat. We do not want to form a movement which is a popular front in unity with the Jewish national bourgeoisie. No, we reject the Jewish national bourgeoisie. We want to form a movement that is uh, exclusively of the Jewish proletariat, which will form the vanguard for the Jewish people. We reject the uh, leadership of the Jewish national bourgeoisie, and we adopt a vanguard role to uh, lead the uh, Jewish people away from Zionism. Now, move on here, Hannah Toff. Hannah Toff was a fighter. She was a warrior, you know. And it's, it's incredible, you know, that uh, that she's lost. Yeah. But here she writes something in reply to Miriam Emmonsberg. So uh, each of the members of the uh, Jewish Bundes diaspora movement, you know, we're uh, doing elaborations, you know, of the concepts, you know, that came out, you know, in terms of what the Jewish Bundes movement was historically and in terms of my uh, own uh, writings, <clears throat> which brought things uh, more up to date. And, and so each of the uh, uh, five comments here were also, you know, addressing each other, you know, as well as elaborating a concept that they had picked up. <clears throat> it was a very lively, you know, like a uh, political culture that we had. And uh, it is preserved now here in their writings. Uriel Adeya, who was a Syrian Jewish actually, writes about Buddhism and Marxism and Leninism. And then the five together here, The lie of independence. Yes, when a country calls itself independent, they're not talking about us. <laughs> you know, they're not talking about the people. They're talking about the power of the state, you know, the national bourgeoisie. And, uh, so we have to redefine independence here. In chapter 10, uh, uh, comrades again talk about Holocaust, Remembrance Day, Yom HaShoah. Hebrew is uh, Yom HaShoah. But actually, in uh, Yiddish, the uh, the name for the Holocaust is the Sharbun, which Yiddish, uh, in Yiddish means, you know, the burning. It means, you know, the utter destruction of the Jewish people, you know, and their elimination, and uh, and the and the um, and uh, it's it's more than a massacre. It's more than a genocide, even, you know. Because it is the obliteration, the eradication, uh, it, and the removal of any evidence of the crime itself, you know, by burning the bodies. So that the existence of the Jewish people in Europe was uh, no longer a historical fact. It's trying to sort of, you know, uh, burn history in effect, because it didn't want to admit that there was such a thing as Jewish people, because the, you know, the Christian churches, you know, were supposed to take over and away from, you know, Judaism, which is supposed to uh, be obliterated. That's why, you know, the, the Nazis, you know, were found it possible to work with the Zionist, you know, parties during the Holocaust because, you know, Zionism, you know, uh, obliterates Judaism as well, you know, ignores it, you know, just, you know, uh, cherry picks, you know, some quotations in order to justify itself, you know, which have no justification in of themselves. And so, we have to evaluate, you know, what the consequences of the Holocaust are in that matter. <sighs> no. The Zionists use the uh, Holocaust uh, as a justification for the establishment of the State of Israel, but this was not, you know, the, the kind of, you know, justification that they used, you know, initially. It was only after 67, you know, that the Holocaust was even remembered, you know, by the Zionist movement. There was no Holocaust Remembrance Days, you know, at that time. The first Holocaust Remembrance Day, you know, in North America was started by 
uh, our uh, Bundes initiative at the uh, at the uh, work, worker circle in uh, Toronto on Lawrence and Bathurst, and uh, with uh, Joe Meslin, the principal of the uh, of the school there, the Parrot School, we had a Holocaust Remembrance Day on the date of the uh, <clears throat> uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in April uh, of uh, 1943. <clears throat> so, and. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, Joe Meslem, he was also a, a victim of a Zionist harassment and he had a heart attack at that time because uh, he was being attacked, you know, for supporting the uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day in the name of the Jewish Bund because uh, the worker circle had gone uh, pretty well Zionist, even though there were social Democrats and they were supposed to include a Jewish Bundist chapter and they were supposed to be, you know, like socialists and all this, you know, but it all melted away. But we had brought it back at that time. Uh, next, Antifa, Vanguard of Education, the Bundes, the Anarchists, and the Marxists. Yes, we're an Antifa movement. And uh, this is uh, a movement that was started in Germany uh, by the uh, Jewish socialists as an anti-fascist organization movement and uh, now continues as such. Hanatov, the 12 Articles of Justice for the Jewish Bundes Diaspora Movement. This is very important. Uh, uh, this is a, sort of an elaboration of a program of the Jewish Bundes Movement you know, in, in, in full. The uh, Hanatov, the Councilman Woman of Strategic Projects, is a further elaboration of the 12 Articles. Bundism and Anarchism and Reciprocity. Yes, reciprocity is a mutual recognition process. It is a methodology. It is a constitutional sort of principle as well, and a principle in the in philosophy that I elaborated. You know, is a whole chapter in my thesis just on the principle of reciprocity, and by recognizing the autonomy of the uh, of the Jewish nationality, uh, this uh, meshes with the anarchist uh, concept of autonomy as well, but it's applied to a national formation, a national collectivity. Or anarchism, you know, usually applies to the autonomy of the individual, you know, with Sorel, you know, like in his individualism, which is basically a form of egotism, which is, you know, basically liberal, you know, like democratic theory in which an individual becomes sovereign. Well, it doesn't work. Okay. So this, you know, does, you know, sort of mesh anarchism in with Bundism, but not the uh, sort of anarchism, you know, that is, is, is attributed to Sorel. So you know, that's an important, very important, you know, feature. Yes, you know, Hanatoff does an elaboration, you know, what, you know, uh, this phenomenon of Netanyahu and Trump is, because they don't represent, you know, themselves, they represent, you know, right-wing populism, and uh, which they didn't invent, you know, they just, you know, jumped on top of it to ride it, you know, as a horse, you know, towards, you know, power, as a means to, you know, grab power. And this is a critique of, uh, of, of that phenomenon. Kevin Stein, you know, the councilman of uh, committees, you know, this road is a concept that's elaborated uh, as an elaboration of Judaism. And then we have Hebrew Judaism and Arab Judaism. Oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, chapter 19. Now, the writings that we have just gone through, you know, like prove that these people existed, you know, because this massacre uh, was not um, accepted, you know, as, as being legitimate or being real, you know, by the New York Times, you know, which had an initial report about, you know, this and then pulled it because, you know, it was Bundes, you know, like, well, you know, like why give, you know, the Bundes, you know, any, any recognition, you know, so even though, you know, they initially recognized it as a massacre, you know, like this was pulled. And, you know, the uh, um, uh, the various, you know, like uh, um, associations of the Jewish political culture that are supposed to protect Jewish people like B'nai B'rith and uh, uh, ADL, Anti-Discrimination uh, um, League or Committee, are supposed to be defending Jewish people, you know, against fascism. And the Nazis, you know, in the United States that are operating, you know, particularly, you know, like, 
particularly in, in Arizona, you know, in the Phoenix and Glendale, you know, police departments even are involved in this Nazi movement there. On top of, you know, Midnight Productions, you know, which exploited, exploited you know, various um, prostitutes and children, you know, for their, for the, uh, uh, for their uh, eroticism. And, uh, you know, they were basically turned into slaves, you know, because of heroin addiction, etc. And, uh, and, and uh, they have uh, uh, gotten away with, you know, carrying out this massacre in 2019, without it being covered by the media, without it being included as a massacre in, in the various, you know, lists, you know, of massacres, you know, even the website that lists all the massacres, you know, together, because there's been an enormous, you know, continuation, you know, in, in, in this particular year of 2023, you know, like there's 167 massacres that have taken place already. But the massacre of 2019 was not listed as such in 2019. So all the writings of these people, comrades, you know, like proves that, you know, that they existed in the first place. Now, the affidavits that follow here are the accounts, you know, the first-hand accounts, you know, people who have seen, uh, you know, the results of the massacre, seen the bodies, and seen the police, you know, taking away the bodies, you know, that had been massacred by the Nazi during 1988. So... We have an affidavit filed by a very important, you know, affidavit filed by an anonymous uh, personality who doesn't want to be killed, you know, by the Nazis, you know, doesn't want to be known. Net, Comrade Net, you know, who saw the uh, results of the massacre, he gives his testimony. Donna, who was there with him, you know, uh, who were late, you know, to coming, you know, to the marriage at the uh, at the synagogue, you know, and and didn't get massacred as a result because they were late, you know, you know, testify here. Uh, the testimony of another uh, a member of the uh, of the cosmopolitan reconstructionist community of, of Phoenix, Arizona. That was the name of the synagogue. Uh, a foreign police officer uh, gives a report of what he you know knows about the police there. Uh, and a, a report about you know what it is you know to experience you know the police fascism in Arizona. Uh, a young black woman also talks about the police there and how they treat people. Another autonomous report, who knew uh, uh, of Omar Hafez. And then the media communique that I had sent out at the time that was not picked up by any media. Now, the first book, you know, goes into uh, further elaborations. You know, the photos of the comrades. Uh, 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 the, yeah, and the Bund Council staff, you know, all the five comrades, you know, sent greetings to me, you know, like, uh, uh, just before they went to the synagogue, you know, because they thought that they might get massacred, you know, but they didn't defend themselves. It's very um, sad, very sad. Uh, this is an article uh, that uh, goes into an elaboration of the video that I did on social orders and class, how the two relate and how uh, social orders, you know, can be even more important in class because, you know, social orders are more oppressed than class formations, you know, the white working class is not as oppressed as the black working class, you know, so the black working class becomes a social order, a caste that is oppressed, you know, uh, because they are black and, and therefore you know, require their own, you know, a revolutionary movement. This is an elaboration of that. Now, this is a letter of solidarity to the uh, uh, Palestinian conference, resistance conference that was taking place in Palestine with whom that I had worked. And so we sent them a message of solidarity. Uh, and then a strategy to combat anti-Semitism. Uh, the uh, the anti-Semitism anti in the context of internationalism and not nationalism as self-determination, but nas uh, national identity as a mutual recognition process, and uh, the, which is the opposite of anti-Semitism. Uh, nationality and citizenship, the difference between the two, uh, uh, my elaboration on Jewishness versus uh, what it is to be Zionist, uh, the role of conservative Ju Judaism within Bundism by Hannah Top, Bundes standard of conservative Ju yeah, strategy by Hannah Top, Crit criticism of the Jewish Bundes diaspora movement by, you know, a member of the Jewish Bundes diaspora movement itself. You know, self-criticism was very important. Um, Jason Unruh. Yeah.
is here. as well, in which he, uh, with an expression of solidarity, you know, is uh, is uh, speaking to the massacre that took place in 2019. Hawk Earl, another person who is, uh, has an affidavit, you know, knows about the massacre and uh, work on the manifesto. And the uh, uh, non-Zionist declaration of 1988, this is the Jewish People's Liberation Organization. It was the first Bundes, a new Bundes chapter and uh, formed the basis of uh, of other struggles. Now, the first book, you know, has uh, a, a set of appendices, annexes, you know, that uh, are necessary in order to study, you know, revolutionary theory. The first is um, the Jewish Bundes critique in the 1920s of Zionism, which has been suppressed. Heinrich Ehrlich, who was, you know, uh, killed by the... Uh, um, a Russian Communist Party regime, you know, was put into prison. And uh, he and the other leader of the Jewish Bundes movement that sought refuge in Russia were, were put into prison instead, you know, when they formed the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. And uh, since, you know, Stalin had an agreement, you know, with, had a pact with Hitler, this was, you know, not kosher. So they were arrested and uh, eventually died in prison. Alter was... Uh, executed, and Ehrlich committed suicide thereafter. Uh, so, uh, but that's his writings. You know, he existed, you know, like, and this is gets out, you know, we brought it back. Uh, Bronstein, who is otherwise known as Trotsky, you know, does an elaboration in the United Front, which is very useful. C.L.R. James, who was also a, a Trotskyist at the time, talks about the, the uh, Black Revolution, you know, within the context of uh, his... Uh, work in 1939, you know, with Trotsky, Bronstein. Uh, Machno was an anarchist who struggled against the, the, the white counter-revolution uh, of the Tsar, Tsar and, and, uh, and uh, I think 18 other countries, including Canada, the United States, which sent troops there to try to defeat the Bolshevik Revolution and failed. But Machno was uh, formed up the Black Army uh, alongside the Red Army fighting against the White Army. But the Red Army wouldn't accommodate, you know, the Black Army, and they would, you know, slaughter each other as well, you know, in the midst of the Civil War. You know, it was totally insane. And, and it was, uh, you know, Bronstein, Trotsky, who was slaughtering, you know, the anarchists, you know, there. And so they slaughtered the Bolshevik, you know, Red Army, you know, units in, in return. Mm -hmm. The anarchist principles of rebellion and civil assembly by Machno, very important. Gaddafi, the white book on Isratin, you know, which he provided a federated solution, you know, a binational solution, you know, to the to the uh, Israeli Hebrew nation and the Palestinian nation that are coexisting, cohabiting there. Mao Street Code, very important, you know, has developed uh, the Panther Code of national cultural autonomy. Winstanley, you know, was leader of the uh, English Revolution. That took place and uh, and and uh, beheaded, you know, the Charles the First, a declaration from the poor oppressed people of England in 1649. Yes, law of freedom and a platform, an elaboration very important. Then we should look at the manifesto of the Paris Commune. The Paris Commune wrote stuff, you know, which is usually sort of ignored. And uh, but here it is. Uh, Yes, and uh, an elaboration of uh, Lenin's uh, work on state and revolution, very important that I have done. Comments on uh, Lenin's state and revolution, very important. Uh, Lenin's constituent assembly elections and dictatorship of the proletariat, in which he elaborates a constitutional process, uh, which was not followed through. Bronson, Trotsky, and C.L.R. James on black and Jewish nationhood. You know, like people haven't read this stuff, you know, like, and it's, it's, you know, fundamental. The permanent revolution postulates, you know, like what the permanent revolution really is, you know, as elaborated by, you know, Bronstein Trotsky. But, you know, the permanent revolution was a concept that was, you know, referred to previously, you know, by other socialist writers, including Marx, but it was never elaborated as a theory. Here it is, you know, in the summarization. Selma James, you know, who's very well known, was also a Trotskyist, you know, in the, um, in one of the factions, you know, in the Socialist Workers Party in the United States, 
uh, which was the you know the uh, the fourth international chapter there. And so some of James Altham is now in the most recent book in, in which he's writing about you know the uh, 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 sex, race, class, and caring for people and planet. You know, organizational. You know, next we have organizational links. You know, of the Bundes movement and uh, the uh, the joint uh, uh, formation that the Bund has uh, inspired, it would seem, you know, uh, called the United International Intercommunalist Convergence Research Sources, you know. So this is, you know, the first book. And this proves the existence of the comrades who were massacred, you know, May 27th and 2019. Now their writings continue. The newest writings are here in book two, which is being uh, collected right now. A Bundism in the National Question. This is a critique of uh, Stalin's uh, a book on the national question, which uh, was uh, basically a polemic against the Jewish Bund. So now here's our reply, as uh, elaborated by Uriah Deo. Uh, the vanguard circle, you know, which is a concept of uh, of leadership, which is vanguardist, but doesn't operate on the basis of, you know, democratic centralism, like, you know, the Marxist parties were doing. So this is a uh, very important, you know, uh, organizational strategy. Uh, then there's a strategy for Jewish men on talking about uh, masculinity. Uh, the Bundes Council Staff Declaration, yes, uh, versus, uh, okay, so Comrade Net, you know, like, um, uh, gets off on uh, denouncing the communist dogmatism against Jewishness, against Judaism, and, uh, and a further elaboration of what the vanguard circle is. Miriam goes into the Demarche. Now, the Demarche is a political movement that is an elaboration of Jewish Bundism, an elaboration of the theory of uh, federation that I, that I launched in, uh, the, uh, in the doctoral thesis, which combines with the Jamaria organizational proposition of the uh, Gaddafi revolution in Libya, uh, and uh, merges them into a theory of a federation that is constitutional, uh, but it is not, you know, a nation state. So it is, you know, a further sophistication and leads into, you know, the kind of, you know, um, country that can be established by social revolution that goes beyond the nation state, beyond liberalism, and beyond the, the Marxist party state, which is basically the same as any bourgeois state, you know, that exists already. Then there's Council on the World Farm, the global class divide, the Council the Reform Judaism, uh, jury and the nations, you know what it all means, Black, Jewish, and Gay by Isaac Kahnenstein, uh, Reconstructing Judaism. What is Black? What is Africa? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, more uh, writings uh, uh, of my own, Healing and Protecting People from the Coronavirus. Yes, this is a, against the formal logic, you know, that was shoved into down people's throats, you know, during the pandemic. And uh, you know, manipulated you know to to believe you know that uh, that uh, there was no uh, other way you know to uh, deal with the pandemic other than you know confinement and and a faulty va uh, vaccine <laughs> that we didn't even provide you know immunization you know because it was merely inhibitor you know of a transmission uh, type of a vaccine and people are still getting you know the. Uh, the, the variant, you know, of the coronavirus that was, you know, uh, circulating at the time. So, you know, this is a whole strategy that uh, is elaborated here by myself uh, as a Bachelor of Science, you know, to uh, critique uh, 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 what is um, um, public health policy. Because, you know, public health policy is still based upon, you know, the treatment of the individual, you know, like with medication. That's basically, you know, like Western, you know, medicine is all about, but it has no idea, you know, how to treat, you know, the, the social uh, body as a whole, you know, in dealing with social health instead of individual health, you know, alone, and uh, which is necessary in order to deal with individual health as well, because, you know, we live in a certain context. Health doesn't exist, you know, like basically on an individual level exists on a social level, you know, and, and health is the same thing for everybody, you know, so it's got to be treated, you know, as if it's a common, you know, concern and not an individual concern alone. You know, that's what, you know, that elaboration is. It's sort of an extension of Bundism into, you know, social policy or um, health, biology, basic. 
basically nations in the international context, international, that is, you know, between nations, you know, not in the concept, you know, international, you know, like in terms of globalization as propagated by the by Americanism. The social program for Quebec, you know, Quebec is a good example of what it is to be a national minority and how to cope with it and what a program would be, you know, for Quebec, you know, in the Federation, if there was a true Federation in Canada. The Abrahamic tradition, yes, they've stolen this, you know, to be the uh, the Abrahamic, you know, uh, concept, you know, uh, of recognizing the state of Israel. <laughs> well, it didn't work. Now, those Arab countries regret having recognized the state of Israel. You know, this, uh, on uh, on the contrary, you know, is an elaboration of the Abrahamic tradition because Abraham, you know, himself, you know, had uh, his first son was, you know, an, what be, became the father of the Arab nations, Ishmael. So in the Abrahamic tradition, you know, you can't sort of differentiate it, you know, between the two, the two children that carry the heritage of, uh, of Abraham, you know, as a patriarch. And uh, because, you know, like it gave rise, you know, to both the Arab nations and to the Jewish nations too. So they have to be merged and this does it. The nation state in the Palestinian nation, you know, who is Jewish, you know, by Black Minister 13, you know, very important elaboration. Because he himself is Jewish, you know, and, he, and he's Black, you know, and a Black Panther to boot, you know, so he would have, you know, very, you know, uh, he's, he's, you know, he goes into the essential nature of what it is to be Jewish, and he's right. So this is, you know, the writings, you know, of all these people. So this both confirms, you know, the existence and of the five comrades, uh, you know, proves that the uh, massacre did take place, you know, with the affidavits, and furthermore, you know, elaborates, you know, on the basic concepts that were developed, you know, by the five comrades, by the preceding work, you know, that I had done, you know, on Buddhism, and uh, elaborates it into a social movement that is applicable, you know, to other such formations as well. So here you have it. And this is uh, on the day of the massacre that took place in 2019. Mm -hmm. Um, May 27th, and with the loss of the five comrades, uh, who nonetheless, you know, left their heritage, you know, here before you for to know and to prove, you know, that the Jewish Bund um, is exists, that it is a threat to many different interests, uh, in particular the Nazi movement, and uh, a threat to the Zionist movement, in particular the Jewish Defense League, you know, which was operating, you know, together with the Nazis there. And uh, shows the way forward, you know, to uh, developing an alternative, you know, to the uh, national chauvinism of both Zionism and Americanism. So uh, I, I wish to uh, present this to you all as a, as a um, concrete elaboration and proof of, uh, of the work that we're doing and how it is continuing. So... Um, there we have it. Um, and I, I hope that I've not gone uh, too long uh, uh, or gone beyond you know, your attentive uh, appreciation of what the significance of this all is. Uh, but uh, here we have it, you know, the proof. And we have the uh, commemoration now in terms of this video for the massacre and uh, others will follow as well. And um, we ask you to share this proof and uh, theoretical elaboration so that others can benefit by it, so that others will know what is happening here, so that we can overcome the censorship by the uh, liberal media, which is refusing to recognize, you know, that the Jewish Bund exists, that the Jewish Bund, you know, is uh, growing and uh, is appreciated by many other tendencies as well. So thanking you for your attention. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld uh, signing off at this time.